Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, friends, family. This is the day that the Lord has made, and once again, we we'll thank God that he allowed us to see a day that was never promised. But like I always say, he didn't allow us to see the day for us, but for us to do his will. Amen. So I trust and pray that you had a wonderful day today. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about a couple of things, uh, two enjoyable things for us, um, and then we'll go ahead and get into the teaching. And the, the number one thing is that, uh, for most of you know, for the last basically year, uh, year and a half, we have allowed uh, uh, churches to uh, be kind and hands to feet with Jesus' ministry and several others to uh, use our parking lots every Saturday to feed and clothe the homeless. And when they were at another location, we used to go out as well. And we have a very large group when we go out and we do barbecuing and uh, we take every kind of item you can imagine household-wise, we take out the even clothes. And so for, another, for a year and a half, um, we have allowed them to use our parking lot. The place where we used to go, uh, the owner uh, stopped everybody from coming out there. Uh, but God had a ram in the bush. Uh, he said, hey, put them in your parking lot to do the same mission. And during that time, uh, Fred from B Time and I would always talk. And he would always remind me of past I've been praying and praying and we find another location. You know, we thank you and the church for allowing us to use it. Uh, we know that you can't come out and support us anymore like you used to because uh, because of our size, we wouldn't be able to fit in, that, in our own parking lot with all of them. So uh, bottom line is that uh, they have found another place. Matter of fact, the church down the street has a larger, big parking lot, a large parking lot. And they seen the activity that was going on in our church and they decided that they were going to open up their parking lot to them. And praise God that they are now have a larger parking lot and Fred and myself, prayers have come to pass. And so they're excited. So this coming Saturday will be the last Saturday uh, for them using the parking lot unless there's a special occasion occurs where they need to come back. But other than that, permanently, they'll be going over to another church parking lot. And again, that gives us the opportunity to go back out doing what we like doing with barbecue and sausage and ribs and hamburgers and hot dogs and bringing in all of the hot food that we normally would bring in. And a lot of the people would try to bypass most of the lines just to come down to our location uh, so they can get hot food. But with all that being said, uh, the bottom line is that our parking lot will now be open uh, after this coming Saturday. And uh, I want uh, hands and feet and be kind and all of them to know that we truly appreciate uh, the support that they have given us as a church as well as taking care of the property. Uh, it was an extreme blessing for us and we thank you tremendously. So there'll be more coming out on that uh, in the near future from uh, Deacon Banks and uh, Sister Outlaw who heads up our outreach ministry. Uh, the second point is that next Sunday, not this Sunday, next Sunday we'll be celebrating our ninth pastoral church anniversary. Woo! Nine years we'll be celebrating. And what an awesome occasion is going to be. Not this Sunday, but next Sunday. And when we think about where we've come from, uh, we started out in school, and um, it, it wasn't all fun in the beginning, but it quickly turned into fun. Uh, we had to set up church, we had to tear it down in the school. And uh, it, it brought us closer together as a church. And we became stronger and stronger when we were working together. And now the Lord has blessed us with our own facility. Uh, we're not leasing, we own the facility only because of the blessing of God. And uh, we uh, look back over those nine years and wow, it's really, really been a blessing. We got a lot more work to do. Uh, but we know that God's hands is on our ministry, and not only our ministry, other ministries that are in the community. You know, we see the hand of God working in those pastors, uh, that, that are pastors of those churches, you know. 
like Covenant Lighthouse Ministry and, and Dr. Joseph Powell for an awesome, superior job that they are doing over there. And also uh, Dr. Reverend Gray, you know, the awesome job that he's doing in Agape Ministry in uh, Millersville, Maryland. And a lot of other churches, you know, uh, Argonne Hills, uh, on, on the coast, you know, they're doing fantastic work as well. So we thank God for how he has blessed us and we'll continue to move forward. Amen? So I thank God for that. Those are the two things I want to talk about. Uh, then I want to go into prayer. And then once we get to prayer, I want to open up this discussion uh, on where we left off last week. And I'm going to rush through that because I talked about most of it in chapter 19 as I was closing. But chapter 20 is going to be very uh, interesting. And uh, we got to make sure you got your pencils and paper because there's going to be a lot of head scratching uh, questions on what in the world is going on and who, who are they talking about. So I'm going to do my best to explain uh, who we are talking about in the scriptures. Let us pray. Eternal Father, I thank you. Once again, you allow us to see a day that we never promised. And we know, Almighty God, that you are in control. You are in control of everything, Lord. And we know, Lord God, that all things that you do are right. We may not fully understand it. We may not even understand it. But we know that all things that you do are right. And all we have to do is learn to trust you. We have to learn to put away our emotions and learn to trust you. And know that no matter what it looks like, no matter what it feels like, because you are over it, it's going to be good. So we have to thank you, Almighty God. Father, I pray for uh, Mr. Leroy. Uh, who's in, in the hospital and pray Lord God that you would help him and strengthen him and touch him like only you can Lord. I pray for Deaconess Jackie and her family as they minister to uh, Mr. Leroy and I pray Lord God for uh, the Johnson family uh, that are going down to a very uh, a, a, a brother, a young brother and a brother-in-law. Father, I pray that you give them peace and comfort. Uh, their hearts are heavy, and only you can remove the sting that accompanies the death of a loved one. So I pray, Lord God, that you will keep them lifted up. Lord, I pray for a sister India. I thank you, Lord God, that you have your eyes on her, and you can do anything you want to do. You don't have to ask anybody. On many occasions, Jesus just spoke healing. You told us in your word that all we can do is all we have to do is just speak the healing and believe it. But you do it in your own time. All we have to do is just speak it and trust you. And not get upset about what we see, but believe in what we've asked for. So we give you thanks, Lord God, for Sister Indira. Constantly pray for Mother Olafon. I uh, thank you, Lord God, for continuing to strengthen her, strengthen her mind, uh, strengthen her heart, strengthen her body physically, that, Almighty God, that she'll get back to the point of where she were, to know that you are in control of everything, no matter what she feels, no matter the emotional state she goes through, the fact that you are in control, and we give you thanks, Father God. I pray for the Fowler family, as usual, I pray for the Graham family, Father, I pray for the, the Sterling family, I pray that you continue to strengthen them, continue the faith that's running throughout that household, Lord God, trusting you, for there's nothing impossible for you. And a lot of times, Lord, things we go through, you put us on display for other people to see. I pray for the, the Powell family, Lord. I pray that you continue to give them wisdom and continue to give them strength, Lord, in the name of Jesus. I pray for Sister Nikki and her family, Father. You know what they're going through. I pray for Brother Warren, Lord. I thank you, oh God, that you are in control. You can do whatever you want to do, Lord. It's yours. You can do whatever you want, and we know you can, but we're going to continue to ask you and continue to trust in your name. Pray for Sister Demery and her mom. I pray for uh, uh, Sister Hainsworth. I pray, Lord God, you give her strength. I pray, God, that you turn her situations around that she deals with day in and day out. Father, I pray for Sister Durant. I pray for Sister Iris, Lord, who's in the hospital. I pray there's nothing impossible for you. There's nothing impossible for you. You have told us to pray, and when we pray, believe. We have a prayer, and we believe. 
So we thank you, Father, because there's nothing impossible for you. And I lift up all of the pastors in the community. I lift up all of the leadership in the community. I lift them up before you, Almighty God, because these are some tough times. They want to get worse on your leadership in your churches. But we give you thanks and we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Okay, okay, okay. We're in the book of Revelations, uh, chapter 19. We're almost finished. Uh, chapter 19. Now, I started in chapter 19, <clears throat> and I was, almost, I was running out of time, so I decided to just go ahead and stop. But I'm going to go back and read 19. I'm going to move pretty fast through 19. I'll hit a couple of points. But my goal is to get into chapter 20. If you remember, some of the things are going to sound familiar from last week because I jumped into 19 when we were closing and I read a couple of scriptures. But chapter 20 is where I really want to get to uh, today. So if you open up your Bibles, again, I'll be coming out of the New King James Version. And I started uh, chapter 19, verse 1. And then he said, after these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, in other words, hallelujah, in other words, praise the Lord. Salvation and glory and honor and power belongs to the Lord our God. You remember that from verse 2 said, for true and righteousness are his judgments because he judges the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Now look at verse 3. Again, they say, Hallelujah, her smoke rises up before her and forever. And the 24 elders, listen to it good, and the 24 elders, verse 4, and the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God, who sat on the throne saying, Amen. Hallelujah. I told you last week, this is one of the times we see God, one or two times we see God praising himself. The other time we see God praising himself is in the book of uh, Genesis chapter 1 verse 31. God praised himself. He said when he saw all things and it was good. He said to himself everything that he did and it was good. And here we see in this verse that he praises himself. And verse 5 says, then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you servants and those who fear him, both small and great. And then we got the verse 6 here, and I heard it as it was the voice of a great multitude and the sound of many waters and as the sound of many thundering saying, Hallelujah or Hallelujah for the Lord omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come. So here we get into the marriage supper of the Lamb which we talked about uh, briefly. <coughs> Look at verse 8. And to her it was granted to be a ray whose her is the church. Remember the church has been raptured. The church is in heaven and it was given to her the church. Remember I told you about the, the other church, uh, which is a harlot. This is a harlot church, and I told you who I believe that church is. And I told you I believe it's a Catholic church, but not this Catholic church now. We're not talking about the Catholic church today. We're talking about in that time, in the future, they would turn right. But here, you notice he uses the term, female term, her, talking about the church, that this modern age church of Christ. <clears throat> Again, verse seven, let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife, the church, has made herself ready. Verse eight, and to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. There we go. He's tying the church in with saints, the righteous acts of the saints. In verse 9, then he said to me, right blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper. 
those who are called to the marriage supper, that's the church. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. This is an angel telling John, don't fall down and worship me because we are brothers. <coughs> he says, worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Then we go to the next verse. He said, now I saw heaven open. I told you, this is the second time you'll find heaven open. The first time heaven was open was in Genesis chapter 4. But Genesis chapter 4 verse 1 is a picture of the rapture. You will never find the word rapture in the Bible, but you will find examples of rapture. And from chapter, uh, Revelation chapter 4 verse 1 is a picture of the rapture when, God, when Jesus said, John, come up hither. Come up here. And in the spirit, he was resurrected, if you will. I don't want to use the term resurrected. He was brought up into heaven. Amen. Verse 9, verse 11. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and make war. Now I told you before, when we looked at the four horsemen, the first horseman, which was Satan, he was riding a right horse. I told you Satan has always been an imitator. He can never produce anything on his own. He imitates. He himself was riding a white horse. Remember, he had a bow, but no arrows. That signified that he was coming in peace. The first part of the tribulation, he was coming in peace. He had a bow, but no arrow. <coughs> okay, now look at the next verse. We see what we saw, actually we saw in that first verse, we saw that Jesus riding a white horse too. Now verse 22, his eyes were like flame of fire. And we know that in Genesis, I mean in Revelation chapter one, those are descriptions of Christ. And on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine white linen, <coughs> the armies in heaven, that's us, this in carefully. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. If you don't know how to ride a horse, you will. Follow him on white horses. Now watch this. The next verse, 15. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a, uh, with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the, the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God, and he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Now you see that he's talking about heaven is open back up. We're going to come back down with him. We're wearing white. That means we ain't fighting nothing. Who, who fights him white? We ain't fighting nothing. It's a sword that's going to come out of his mouth that's going to tear up everything. We're just coming back. Amen, amen, amen. Now look at verse 17. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the, in the midst of heavens. I will stop there, that midst of heavens. Remember, heaven has three layers. The first heaven is the heaven where the birds fly. The second heaven is where the moon and the galaxies are. And the third heaven is where God himself is. He's talking about the first heaven, which is where the birds are. Okay, now watch it again. Look at it again, verse 17. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying, To all birds that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather together for the supper of the great God. Now, this is talking about God and make God. The battle is going to take place, the battle of Armageddon. This is what he's talking about. Remember, we talked about that in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 38, chapter 39, the battle of Gog and Magog, okay? Now, look at the next verse, verse 18, that 
you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. This is the battle I'm going to We're going to see this again as we move forward. Okay, look at the next verse. And I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies <coughs> gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet who worked signs in his presence by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast. He deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image. These two were cast alive into the lake of fire. So who was cast alive in the lake of fire? We see that the beast was captured and with him the false prophet. They were cast into the lake of fire. Okay? Now keep that in mind. We're going to see it again. The, these two were cast in the, in the, alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Now look at verse 25. And the rest were killed. The rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. That was Armageddon, the battle of Armageddon. Now, this is interesting because it said that it was basically Jesus who came out of heaven. <clears throat> and I'm bringing a point up because we're going to see it again. And it probably answers my question or confirms my answer that I came up with. We, Jesus comes out of heaven. We fall in behind him. He comes with a sword in his mouth. The, the beast and the false prophet, they both are going into the lake of fire. But the mighty men of those individuals who are not angels, they're people, they're stuck. It's Jesus by the sword of his mouth. Now watch this. Matter of fact, let me go back right quick and, and read that and then we're going to move forward. Look at verse 20, 21. And the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him, capital H him, so we know it's Jesus, who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. We're talking about Armageddon. So we know it's Jesus. He came down to deal with the false prophet and the beast. Now, Here's what we're going to think we're going to get kind of tough. And you got to put your thinking cap on. You got to put your thinking cap on. Now, Revelation chapter 20, starting at verse 1. He says, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, <clears throat> having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Verse 2. He laid hold of the dragon that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Verse 3, and he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. So we have an angel. We don't know who this angel is, but this angel bound Satan. Now, I believe this angel, I believe this angel is Jesus. Now, a lot of biblical scholars don't believe it's Jesus. They believe that it's one of the other angels. They don't know which one, but they believe it's one of the other angels who is doing this to Satan. And their reasoning is because, their reasoning is that God doesn't have time to mess with a little bitty person like Satan when God created him. 
So he would let one of his other angels do the work. This is their thinking. But I think that this angel is Jesus. And here's the reason why I'll tell you. Go to Jude 9. Jude 9. And here's the reason why I think it's Jesus. And Jude 9 said, Yet Michael, the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dare not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, the Lord rebukes you. In other words, Michael, the archangel, when he was in a dispute with Satan about Moses' body, he, he, he dared not bring a charge against Satan, but he just said, the Lord rebukes you. He himself, the archangel, he would not dare bring in a charge against Satan. And my reason of thinking that if the archangel Michael, if he was saying that he would bring a, a charge against him, but the Lord rebukes you, that would, to me, signify that this may be Jesus who actually takes hold of Satan and puts him into the bottomless pit with this chain and one lock. But a lot of biblical scholars don't believe it's Jesus because they don't think that Jesus will stoop down that low just to deal with somebody like Satan. God himself don't have to waste his time dealing with somebody like Satan. But I, that's who I believe it is. So let's read it again. Let me read, read that again to you. It says, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. Now, that word, you see, you see the term his, that's a lowercase s. Normally when it's Jesus, it would be a capital S, a capital H. But in my book, it doesn't have it as a cat, has it as a small. So that's significant there. It may be an angel. But I think it's Jesus because the archangel Michael, who is probably one of the most powerful angels in heaven, he dared not bring a charge against Satan, but said, the Lord rebukes you. But this is a small S, a small HS hand. Verse 2, he laid hold of the dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. A thousand years is translated the millennial. Now, many of you have heard about the millennial period that's going to be coming. A thousand year millennial period. We're going to get into that as we move forward. So just buckle your seatbelt. Because you might have questions. And I might have answers and I might not have answers. So let's look at it again and then we'll move forward. Verse 2. He laid hold of the dragon, which we know is Satan. That serpent of old, who is the devil. And Satan, the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years. Verse 3, And he cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal on him, so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were up. Look at that word, deceive. That's his M.O. All he does is deceive people. And it's a shame that it's people today in the world are being deceived by Satan. You and I are not. We know his motives. We trust in God. We've accepted Jesus Christ. But those who have not accepted Jesus Christ, Lord, those who are questioning whether this is a, he's a deceiver. He deceives people because he knows he's lost the battle. When Christ was resurrected from the dead, he was finished. He knows he lost. But he's going to take as many people to hell with him. Many people. But he's a deceiver. You see it right there that he would deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. Now, watch this. Look at verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Let me read again, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. In other words, 
they were given the power of judgment. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded. Now, that word beheaded is basically translated uh, persecuted. Amen. Persecuted. So when you see that word like beheaded, it's basically translated that they were persecuted for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast of the or his image and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So we know that this group lived and reigned. These are the martyrs that, that John said I saw beheaded. But that word beheaded is persecuted. These are the saints that I saw present. This is during the tribulation period. They were beheaded or persecuted. He said, I saw their, watch this. He said, I saw their souls. That word soul can be translated spirit. I saw their spirit. Like I told you, we have a body, but we are spirit. We live in a body. He said, I saw their spirits. Amen. Now, I want to go back and look at something because he says this, look at uh, verse 4 again. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them. Who is the they sat on them and judged? Well, we really don't know, but we have an idea. Uh, go to Matthew uh, chapter 19. Let's take a look at some possibilities. Matthew chapter 19. This is Jesus said. So Jesus said to them, he's talking about the saints, the church, or surely I say to you that in the regeneration, when the sons of man sit on the thrones of his glory, you, he's talking to somebody, you will have followed, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging, watch this, the 12 tribes of Israel. Whoa. I've always been confused about that for the most part. But he's saying, can you see the significance of the church in this? He's saying that the saints who follow him will also sit on thrones and judge the 12 tribes. You read it, judge the 12 tribes. So when you see that word judging, sitting on thrones, judging, he basically said the church is going to be sitting on thrones, judging. And he puts out a group, he said, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. <clears throat> now, look at this, look at this other verse. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 and 3. Paul said, do you not know that the saints, here we go again, the church, the saints, will judge the world and if the world will be judged by you are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters do you not know that we shall judge angels how much more things that pertain to this life we will judge angels now I believe the angels he's talking about are those that are in hell those demonic angels who follow Lucifer or Satan out of heaven was kicked out. Those demons, the demonics that we know that Jew talked about in the book of Jude, that are in the heart of the earth, they are bound. And I did that study about where did the giants come from in Genesis chapter 6. I think it was like a three-month study on where did these giants come from. And we even went into some books that are not even in the Bible some of the books that, 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 that pointed out some things. Amen. So he talks about us sitting on thrones, the church being judges. Look at the, uh, again, let me read that again, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been persecuted for their witness to Jesus, 
and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast of the or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on, on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years, millennial. So they too is there. This is important because I'm going to go somewhere that's going to be very confusing. Now look at the next verse, 5. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand year were finished. The rest of the dead did not live until the end of the thousand year reign was finished. Okay, now I'm going to get into some things that are going to leave you baffled. Believe me. Let's look at verse 5 again. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. This is the first resurrection. Now, I'm going to go into some stuff. Let me see how I'm going to do this. This is the first resurrection. When you see the first resurrection, let me put it this way. When you, when you see that word first resurrection, uh, uh, resurrection first of all, look, what is resurrection? Let me first point that out. Because somebody may not know what the resurrection is. Resurrection is being the first raised from the dead. That's resurrection. <clears throat> being first raised from the dead. Now, a lot of people will always say, well, Jesus was not the first. Uh, you got uh, 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 Lazarus. Lazarus was raised from the dead. But Lazarus wasn't resurrected. You got the widow, uh, uh, Jairus' daughter, who was raised from the dead. But she wasn't resurrected. Jesus was the first to be resurrected. The resurrection means that once you die and you are raised from the dead, you don't die no more. So make sure you understand that. The resurrection means that once you're raised from the dead, you die no more. Jairus' daughter had to die again. Lazarus, yeah, was raised from the dead, he had to die again. But when Jesus died and was raised from the dead, he was the first of the resurrection. He never dies again. That's what you mean, or we mean by the term resurrection. You will never die again. Yeah, people in the Bible died and came back to life, but they had died again. Jesus only died one time and he was resurrected. And then after that, everybody followed. Let me point out a, a, a scripture first and then I'll go into it. Uh, look at Colossians chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. Colossians chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. And Paul writes, and he is before, talking about Jesus, and he is before all things. And in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Now, that word firstborn from the dead is translated the resurrection. Look at it again. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he who, Jesus, is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in, that in all things he who, Jesus, may have the prince. In other words, Jesus is the firstborn of the dead. Now, look at this next, look at the next, look at John chapter 5. John chapter 5, verse 28 to 29. I'm going to have to go through this to make this make sense to you. It says, do not marvel at this. For the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice 
and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemning. Now, look at that again. You need to get, if you can't get this part, the rest of it ain't going to make sense to you. Again, do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves. Now, remember, you are spirit. You're not in the grave. Your body is. Get that. Get that in your mind. Your body is in the grave, not you. Look at it again. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the grave, the body, not you, will hear his voice and come forth. Now watch how he breaks it down. This is Jesus talking. Those who have done good to the first resurrection or to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of confirmation. So we see two resurrections. This is important. It's critical. Otherwise, you ain't going to get this. You see two resurrections. Jesus just pointed out there are two resurrections. There's a resurrection of the good. There's a resurrection of the bad. Now, as we go forth, let me explain something to you because when you start looking at this term, resurrection, if you're not careful, you're going to get caught up in what's called, and I talked about it before, uh, pre-trib, mid-trib, and post-trib. In other words, tribulation period. The church, in my opinion, will be resurrected, well, the church member will be um, raptured before the Antichrist comes on the scene. Before the first tribulation, before the second tribulation, the church will be raptured up first. Those are pre tribulations Many people believe that. The mid tribulations believe that the church will go through the first three and a half years of the good years with the Antichrist and then get extracted out. The post-tribulation believers believe that the church is going to go through the entire tribulation period. And then in the end, they're going to be with the millennial. This 1,000 year is when they're going to reign. That's what post tribulations believe. I'm a pre tribulations I believe the church will be raptured before the Antichrist comes on the scene. The book of Thessalonians explained that to me clearly. Amen. So, <clears throat> so I hope you got that. He, Jesus tells us there are two resurrections. Remember, Jesus is the firstborn of the resurrection. He's the firstborn. Now, that's important. Now, let me go back. Look at it again, verse 5. He said, but the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand year were finished. So we got somebody living during the thousand year reign. Those are the saints. They have already been resurrected. But there are some folks who still have not been resurrected yet. And they are the evil ones. But I'm going to make it clear as we go forward. Now again, verse 5. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand year were finished. This is the first resurrection. The first resurrection. Now, pre tribulations see the first resurrection is a, a stage. It's, it's, a, it's a stage. It's not a one-time deal. It's a stage. Because if you see the first tribulation or the first uh, resurrection as a one-time deal, you're going to fall into the camp of a post tribulations if you see it as a one-time deal, you're going to fall into the camp of post tribulations because you're going to say that they were only resurrected during, or right after, during the millennial period. But that's not the case. When you, look at the, when you look at the term, the first resurrection, you have to look at it in stage. The first resurrection stage is the church. You got it? The second resurrection stage is still the first stage, it's still the first resurrection. The second part of that is the two witnesses. Remember when we read about the two witnesses, I think it's Revelation chapter 11 or chapter 12, chapter 12, the two witnesses, when they were raptured up. And then the third stage of the first resurrection is the mortars or those who went through the tribulation period, they are resurrected. And now you've got basically three groups 
That's in the first resurrection. If you see it that way, you will see it as being a pre trinity Because there's this one resurrection, but it's got three groups. In that, resur in, in that resurrection, you got three groups. Amen? So let's look at it again. Verse 5. But the rest of the dead, he keeps saying the rest of the dead, that's those evil ones, did not live again until the thousand year reign was finished. In other words, while the thousand year reign was going, those who were dead, they stayed dead. Now watch this. Their bodies stayed there. Remember, spirits don't go in the ground. Now watch this. Look at verse 5. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now, there we go. I just talked to you about that resurrection. <coughs> Excuse me. That resurrection is resurrection one is in stages. He's telling you, look at it again, but if you do that, if you miss it, you're going to get confused. Verse 6. <coughs> Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Who's the first resurrection? The church? Who's the first resurrection? The two witnesses? Who's the first resurrection? Those who were mourned during the tribulation period. Those are the first brothers. You remember what he said, John said, I saw the, the souls and the spirits of those who have been beheaded or persecuted. All of us was a part of the first resurrection. Now watch this. Again, you have to see it that way. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Now, watch this. I'm going to write you something right here and show you this. Again, let me read that. I'm going to stop at one point. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Oversets the second death. The second death. With the first resurrected, you have experienced death. But there's another death coming. That's the death that puts you in, in Hades or put you in, 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 in a, a, a fiery furnace, the brimstone. That's the second death. The church and the righteous won't experience that death. Only those who follow Satan. Now get that picture in your mind. Only those who follow Satan, they're going to die like everybody else. But then there's a second death that's going to put them in hell. That's the second death. Only those who follow Satan is going there. Now let me back read it and see if it makes sense to you. Verse 5. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Again, that's the church, the two witnesses, and those who are mortal. Over sex, the second death. Those who was in the first resurrection, we have power or blessings over such the second death. Has no power. But they shall be priests and God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Those who follow Satan, they are spirits of second death. Not the church, not the two witnesses, not those in the tribulation church who were mortal. They want to experience that. Look at verse 7. Look at verse 7. Now, when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, God and may God, to gather them together to battle whose numbers is as the sands of the sea. Again, here we go again. God and may God. May God is the ruler of God for all of those nations. They're going to come against Jerusalem. They're going to come against the saints. Remember, this is after the millennial period. During the millennial period, when the church and all the other saints come back with Jesus, there's still going to be other people in the earth realm. There's still. Now, the question that nobody has an answer to, and I'm continuing to research and research, and I can't find an answer, and I might not find an answer. The question is, 
during the millennial period, when the saints come back, the ones who are in the earth realm who has not accepted you, will they accept him? Are there going to be any that accept him? Because this we don't know. But we do know that those who are there who have not accepted him, they're going to become part of Satan's army for God and may God. Those are the people who are going to join that army to fight against Jerusalem. Oh, man, I hope I'm making sense. Let's look at it again, verse 7. Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations. There we go again. Deceive, which are in the four corners of the earth. God and make God to gather them together to battle whose number is as the sands of the sea. Work that in verse 9. They went out, they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. The fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Verse 10. Now, let's stop right there. The fire came down out of heaven to devour them, to kill them. God made God, who were coming against the city, which is Jerusalem, the saints, or the church, and everybody who accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. All of them. And, and I believe as well as those who were in the Old Testament. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all of them. David. Now, verse 10. The devil who deceives them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophets are. And they will be tormented day and night forever and forever. That's why I'm telling you, there's no such thing as death. You see the body go, your loved one is not dead. Your loved one is either in, in Hades or in a place waiting or in heaven with God. That's where your loved one is. Their bodies you've seen go in the ground, but not the spirit. These, he said they will live forever and ever, tormented day and night, forever and ever. Why? Because they're spirits. They don't die. There's no such thing as death. And I know it's hard, but the more you begin to understand it and come to grips with it, sometimes it makes you feel a little bit better when you lose a loved one, that you will see them again. God promised us, we'll see them again. We just got to make it through the pain. We just got to make it through the suffering of missing them and missing their body and being in the presence with us. We just got to get to the point of missing. But the thing we can hold on to is that he promised we'll see them again. And this time when we see them, there won't be no more suffering. There won't be no more no pain. There won't be no more sorrow, no more tears, none of that. That's how it's supposed to be in the garden. But Adam screwed that up. But anyway, let me move on. Uh, I know I ain't going to get finished with this. I knew I should have went straight to 20. Uh, verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne. And him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. Now, this is the great white throne judgment. There are two judgment seats. There's the judgment seat of the great white throne, and then there's the judgment seat of Christ. That's in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 10 uh, is the judgment seat of Christ. Two judgments. The great white throne judgment, judgment seat of Christ. If you let me put it this way. You want to be at the judgment seat of Christ. The great white throne judgment, you're finished. It, 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 it's not a court. And they're not trying to find out whether you're guilty or not. They already know you're finished. So if you find yourself at the great white throne judgment, because understand, watch this. Remember when we read this, Satan, the false prophet, and the beast, they were already cast into the fiery furnace. But the people, the humans, are have to stand before the judgment first. Amen. Have to stand before the judgment. So again, look at it again. Verse 11. Then I saw a great white throne, and him 
who sat on it, from whose face the earth had first, first and the heavens fled away, and there was found no place for them. Verse 12, and I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. I'm going to hit this point right here, then I'm going to, well, you know what, I'm, I'm almost finished. I'll keep on going. Okay, now watch this. I want you to see this right quick. I'm going to read it real fast, chapter 12, verse 12 again. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. He saw dead, no, small and great, those who were popular, those who are unpopular, no matter who you are. And the book, and the books, more than one, the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. Now, the point I want to bring out here is there are going to be, looks like, different levels of punishment in hell. Everybody in hell don't get the same punishment. Everybody in hell don't get the same punishment. Amen? Now, watch this. Look at the... Um, uh, let me see. Go to Luke, Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, verses 46 and 47. Luke chapter 12, it says, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour when he is not aware and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes or many, some translate have many bows, many blows. This is a, 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 a symbolic indicator that there are different levels of punishment in hell. Now, let's go back and look at this again. I hate to go back there, but I'm going to have to. Verse 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged. The dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. So their works were being written. The things that they did in this life was being recorded, and they were being judged by what they did. Some people did things worse than others. Some people, watch this, some people were some of the best people in the world, but they didn't make Jesus Christ their Lord and Savior. But they did, they did, they did all the other stuff good, but they didn't make Christ. They won't be at the same level of those who just flat out hated Jesus. Those who, did, who, who didn't accept him, but tried to do what was right, they will have less punishment than those who just flat out hate Jesus. Amen? Now look at the verse, next verse. Verse 13. The sea gave up the dead who were in it. Now, when you see that word sea gave up the dead, that's basically saying the bodies that were never buried. Anybody that was never buried is considered to be a part of the sea that was given up. Again, verse 13, verse 12. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death in Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. I believe those who were in them are those Old Testament saints and those uh, demons that were in hell when Jesus went down to set them free. And they were judged, each one according to his work. They were judged. Now watch this, the next verse. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Again, this is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Anyone not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So this is the second death. Christians want to experience this. Those who accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, those Old Testament saints who trusted God, they won't see this second death. This second death is only for those 
who, who disobeyed God, who did not have Jesus Christ Lord say, they will see the second death. You already made it. We've already made it. Now, here's the point I want to bring up about the spirit and death. Remember when Jesus died on the cross, his body went into the tomb, but the Bible said his spirit went down into the underworld, and he set the captives free. His body went in the tomb. He went down into the underworld. That's the same way your loved one, their body went into the grave. They did not. They went up to heaven if they were saved. They went to heaven. So away with this stuff of believing that the spirit goes in the ground. Spirits can't die. There's no such thing as spirit dying. The Bible says in Hebrews 14, 1, are not angels ministering spirits? Have you ever heard of an angel dying? The angels don't die. Even these crazy angels, they going into a bottomless pit. They going into the fire for, forever. They're going to suffer forever. There's no such thing as death as we know it. So if it can bring you any kind of comfort, any kind of joy. My mama who died many years ago, I'll see her again. My identical twin who died many years ago, I'll see him again. Don't you remember when David, when his, when, when he, when his uh, child was taken, died? When he, when he slept with um, um, Uriah's wife, the Hittite, and the baby died? David said, I can't go to him. He said, he can't come to me. But I can go to him. In other words, when I die, I'll see him. He even testified to the fact. So I'll leave you with this. Two resurrections. The first resurrection includes the stages of the saints. The second resurrection includes the, 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 the devil and the evil ones. They're in the second resurrection. There's only the second death is those who are the evil one, their second death is hell. Everybody got a first death. The body goes in the grave, spirit goes. That's the first death. The second death is that when they stand, when they stand before the judgment, they go into hell. That's the second death. We don't have a second death. That's why I said we have power over the second death. We don't go in there. So I hope that makes sense. So as a pre trimmers there are levels to the first resurrection. The Bible said that Jesus is the firstborn of the dead. He's the firstborn of the dead. We come behind him. Amen? Spirit of the living God, I thank you. I thank you for this book. For you said in your word, whosoever read this book shall be blessed. And we thank you for the blessing that you have given us for studying this book. We have a little bit more to go. But I pray that you continue to open up our eyes that we may see clearly. I thank you, Almighty God, for your vision. I thank you for making clear that we are spirit. You said in your word, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. And we know that you are spirit because Jesus himself said, those who worship you must worship you in spirit and in truth. So we know you are spirit. And we know that we are created in your image. For thus we are spirit. In your book, chapter 2, verse 6, Genesis said, and chapter 7, verse 7, said you formed us from the dust of the ground. So we have a body that's our house, but our spirits, we live in it. But we will soon depart from it and come back to you to reign forever. I pray for those who don't know you. I pray for those who Satan has deceived. Father, if any glimmer of hope, I pray that you would turn the hearts of those who have not accepted you. There are many who are the children of parents, and there are many parents who are the parents of children who will not accept you because of the deception of the devil. Your word clearly shows us that Satan is not bound right now. He'll be bound during the millennial period, but right now he's still receiving as you're still reigning. But I pray, Almighty God, by your Holy Spirit, that you will open the eyes of many, that they may come to you and accept you as Lord and Savior. Use us. Open up our mouths and our eyes.
eyes to speak on your behalf that people may see and they may hear. I speak a blessing over the entire church all around the world. I thank you, Almighty God. I speak in the name of Yahshua. Touch like only you can. You said that the word would go forth and heal. This word thus goes forth with faith and heal. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll see you Sunday if God's willing.